it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. Um, Hanif Abdurraqib is the author of There's Always This Year on Basketball and Ascension, the book we are all here to celebrate, as well as A Little Devil in America, a sweeping look at black music, art, and culture that won the Carnegie Medal and the Gordon Burns Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Award. His other works include the essay collection, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, which was named a best book of 2017 by Esquire, the Chicago Tribune, and NPR, among other outlets. Go Ahead in the Rain, notes to a tribe called Quest, a New York Times bestseller, and a National Book Critics Circle Award and Kirkus Prize finalist. And the poetry collection, A Fortune for Your Disaster, winner of the 2020 Lenore Marshall Prize. His other essays, poems, and criticism have been published in a wide array of media. Um, in There's Always This Year, Abdur Rakib offers an emotional and historical meditation on basketball. Who makes it? Who we think we should be successful in the game? And also on the very notion of role models. It's about being from a place or a situation maybe that people sort of talk about wanting to escape and not wanting to do that because everything you need and everyone you love is already there. Joining Abdur Rakib on stage is Era D. Matthews. Era Matthews is the 2022-2023 Philadelphia Poet Laureate and directs the poetry program at Bryn Mawr College. Her collection, Simulacra, won the 2016 Yale Series of Younger Poets Prize, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, Best American Poets, Gulf Coast, Harvard Review, and VQR, among other journals. Matthews' other honors include a 2022 Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellowship, a 2020 Pew Fellowship, and the 2016 Rona Jaffe Foundation, Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Her latest work, Bread and Circus, addresses themes of income inequality, commodification, and convention conventional economic theories through poetry, prose, and imagery. And this book was nominated for an LA Times Poetry Book Prize. Okay, silence your cell phones one more time. <laughs> and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hanif Abdurraqib and Era Matthews to the stage. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really good to be here and really good to see you all. Um, opening day tomorrow, yeah? <laughs> How do we feel about our Phillies? <laughs> I say our Phillies because I am here, and so therefore they are <laughs> as much mine as they are yours. If anyone has read There's Always This Year, we'll get to the first line and say, there's the hour. <laughs> Everything can be ours. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. I really love this city, and um, every time I come here, I feel very full. It feels in some ways, um, and I'm not just saying this, like people who saw me here like last year and in years past, I see this all the time. Philadelphia and Columbus are sister cities in my brain um, because the sheer amount of Muslims who, were, who are certainly still here, but when I was younger, I for real thought Muslims in America only existed in like Columbus, Dearborn, and Philadelphia. <laughs> because that's just like the arc, you know, if you like lived in the Midwest, you would just drive up through Dearborn and everyone had Muslim kid folk, and then you come to Philly and my family had Muslim kid folk. So I was like, all the Muslims in America are just in these three. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna read to begin, and I'm gonna read a thing about um, fire and heartbreak. And um, this stems from a friend of mine who is in this book, who I love deeply. When LeBron James left Cleveland to go to Miami, people were just burning jerseys everywhere. <laughs> just like taking jerseys and burning them. There were like trash cans burning in Columbus. And a friend of mine ran out of his house with his old LeBron James jersey and he was about to set it on fire. And he went to go throw it in the trash can and he pulled his hand back at the last minute. And I said, what did you do that for? And he said, I think I would like to save it in case he comes back. <laughs> and I remember thinking that was just really tender. This thing that happens when someone leaves us or we leave someone, I guess what I'm saying is the veil between heartbreak and desire is very thin and sometimes I think we furnish a world wherein a person might return comfortably even if we know they are not going to because the furnishing of that world uh, 
does better for us than the actual reality of the person, if that makes sense. And so it's like, I have, if I have a sweatshirt from an ex whatever who I loved and still love, I can tend to that sweatshirt better than I can tend to the complexities of the person who was once in it. And uh, so I'm gonna read a bit about fire and heartbreak and desire and wanting people back. Though I suppose fire is a type of song too. Some might say fire is a song that arrives after all the begging has exhausted itself and after all those who reasonably asked and prayed and wept rise from their knees and make use of newly idle hands. Don't know what good it is to burn a few cheap jerseys and a pair of sneakers with fire. Sure enough gonna have its say one way or another. Just let anyone who has ever stood in front of a police precinct with fingertips reeking of gasoline wrapped around a bottle, a lighter itching in their pockets tell it. Just let anyone taping a bomb underneath a car tell it. Just let the niggas who want their hood back one way or another tell it. But definitely don't let the gentrifiers ever tell it. And look, I'm not placing a value or morality judgment on the shit, I suppose. It depends on who and what is doing the burning and what brought the burning to life. But fire is a song, a whole symphony if you allow it to be. And I don't just mean it sounds. The way it disrupts the sky with a snapping of fingers. Rhythmic if you catch it on the right notes, I suppose. It depends on who and what is doing the burning there, too. But I mean the hands. I mean it's made I mean the things that drag people to its urgent heat to watch and spread its gleeful damage. The people who bring every wayward feeling they've held beneath a near, behind a near bursting door and throw it in the flame. People who bring what some might plainly call sadness, but what we know as the dry and fraying pages of our past lives peeled off and accumulating in all the places we can't avoid. And so. Let's instead say hauntings. Yes, bring your hauntings down to the fire and throw them in. Bring not just the trinkets and tokens of dismantled love, but bring your broken hearts, the whole damn faulty machine. There are enough new ones to go around. There are those who might say fire carries a mercy with it, which I take to mean that it doesn't prolong the anguish in the promised land. On the other side of this sometimes wretched scroll of miserable spinning days, I would guess that decorum there will suggest that we not ask each other how we died or what dying felt like. The way that's those who have been locked up don't ask people how they got there but the living have thoughts on burning scientists say it's the worst feeling imaginable at first but then nothing the heat from the fire quickly chews through nerves renders a dying person without feeling the dying person they say is transported toward a type of ecstasy and forgive my wandering into the fantasies of no longer living once again but I would want to hear from someone who crossed over no telling how I'll go whenever I go but I am skeptical of anyone living who suggests that any any part of dying is less painful than it seems in the physical sense or otherwise, but I want to believe, knowing as I do that I absolutely will one day have both legs over the fence that divides living from whatever comes after, and knowing as I do that leaping from the top of that fence might not be my choice, I would like to believe in this idea of ecstasy, or at least a moment where there is awareness of what consumes us, but no physical feeling to attach it to. Look, I respect fire, like I respect any song that bends to the desire of the person who summons it. The flame is political, of course, but it is sometimes mundane and sometimes romantic and sometimes simply a necessity. And not all necessities are political, but some certainly are mundane and a few damn sure are something close to romantic. And speaking of burning for a brief candescent moment before there is nothing left to be felt, this too is longing, or at least one stage of heartbreak, the earliest stage when any damage will do. And it is seductive to watch some shit go up in flames, even though the burning won't bring back anything any of us miss or love. But that ain't the point. I get why the jerseys burned in Cleveland. I get why men gathered around and sacrificed their once beloved garden thinking how quickly can we get past the part where we feel everything and cross the other threshold gasping and numb in Oakland in 2009, black people were asked, how could you burn down your own neighborhood? And in Cincy, in 01, black people stood in front of glass, bent into a scarred web like a wounded moon, and they were asked, why would you do this to your own? And in Bloomington in 2000, white kids turned over cars and a basketball coach got fired, but no one really asked much. In Los Angeles in 1992, black folks stared into news cameras, their faces half illuminated by the glow from burning buildings disrupting the night, and someone with a microphone asked, why here, in this place, you live here? And in 1989, in Tampa, in 1980, in Miami, in any place where black people have been conductors to a symphony of fire, in any place where there were buildings once and then only ash, only the scent of hot wood or brick or paint, the question is always about how people could do this to their own place. And there are many answers, and most of them are about how none of this shit is ours. You have mistaken being in a place for having control over it. A mistake I've made before but certainly did not make with a brick in my hand. 
and a bandana over my face. It is harder to sell this on the evening news, but the fire is a baptism. The fire says, get gone and we can start clean. And so then what isn't your own can become your own. If it is all some vast and empty burn down nothing at the end of a long night. And I know this isn't generous to the shop owners and the elders who have lived on a block for decades and wanted to die on a block that was at least close to how they remembered it. But what can I do to convince you that fire is not the villain? And the person who lights a match isn't a villain. The people cheering while a building burns aren't the villains. There are villains, surely, but they aren't here, not among a people seeking deliverance. The villain is an invention. Our enemies, the ones I promised we'd leave behind, those are inventions, but they are inventions born out of a heart's breaking. I swear to you, I would never take to the streets looking to watch something burn if my heart were not broken. If, through its breaking, I did not need to invent an enemy, nameless and faceless as a brick building or a glass window, woven through almost every story of heartbreak, there is a villain, even if the name isn't spoken out loud, or even if, through a retelling of the damage, a person smiles and reassures their audience there are no hard feelings. Tell me you have not invented a reason to transform the beloved into the wretched at least one time to yourself in the quiet of a dark room when the weight of loneliness demanded you find a target, at least now. Now, at the start of it all, I have been sad and have not yet wanted to look directly into the light of that sadness, and so I have distracted myself with the manufacturing of villainous moments from a person I loved and certainly still love. And I may never speak these imagined moments out loud, but I cling to them. The time they accidentally broke a picture frame holding a photo of my mother as a living, smiling younger woman. I can for this exercise, convinced myself this was surely a larger character flaw. They were always so clumsy, after all, and inconsiderate, surely. They never really listened to me when I talked about things that interested me, right? Probably, I guess, that's bad enough. I can't believe I wasted my time with such a selfish person, and I am mad at them now, not for leaving, but for being here in the first place. And forgive me, but I love the pure spectacle of a people newly in pain or newly feeling rejection, how hurt flows into rage, one body of water tumbling into another, larger body of water in the summer of 2010 amidst the burning of old fabric. I didn't know if I believed LeBron James to be a villain, but I did relish watching the rationalizations of my pals, all of them, imaginations in overdrive, watching game five of the Celtics series to attempt to determine exactly when LeBron quit on the team, when he decided he was leaving, even though there was a series still to be won. One pal of mine watched tape of the third quarter of game five all through August, a quarter where LeBron went two for seven, and my pal would mumble, that was it. He was trying to lose. Just wanted to get the fuck out of here sooner. This is a strange but necessary subplot of heartbreak, one that is easiest for me to access when I've been rejected, when I am back at the doorstep of a familiar pain. It isn't so much that if you see something enough, you begin to believe it. It's that the belief is already there, already planted and waiting to be ignited by seeing. And the seeing could be anything. One missed shot or one forgotten return phone call or one kiss that didn't feel like the others. Yes, I have been sad and have convinced myself of anything and everything. There is a mountain between the immediacy of anguish and the far off hopefulness of clarity and it is easiest to convince anyone scaling its outskirts that anything they are feeling is justified that list of things ignored in the past all of them were weapons for example if i watched game five footage long enough i could easily convince myself that i was watching someone give up on not just a game but also a team also a city also a people and then we have an enemy and i cannot love an enemy at least not out loud. Out loud, I curse my enemies. I only want them back in the silent hours. Okay. So I guess I'm going to start this off by saying, what are you listening to right now? Um, I'm on a big Shaka Khan kick right now. In terms of new, new shit, there's like a lot of new shit that I, I, I listen to stuff so heavily every week. The band, is Sweet Pill a Philly band? Yeah. yeah. The band Sweet Pill is like one of my, they're one of my favorite bands in the world right now. And they came out with the EP last week, two weeks ago maybe. And I've been listening to that nonstop. Um, there's this other band called Big Hug that I love that came out with an EP a couple weeks ago that I, or maybe they came out with an EP a few weeks. But right now in terms of like, I'm on a big Shaka Khan kick because um, Shaka Khan and I, I'm now like rubbing shoulders, of, I'm name dropping in a way. So I'm, Shaka Khan and I, Shaka Khan and I, we're not featured, she doesn't know I exist, but I'm saying like, we were featured in a magazine again, like she had a, she has an article, a feature in a magazine I also have a feature in, and I got the physical magazine like two days ago, and I was like, holy shit, Shaka Khan is in here. 
and like I turned the page, I was like, I'm in here. And so I, I've been I've been a big shot on a Shaka Khan of Rufus Kick. Um, and the Soul Children, I've been listening to them a lot. Mm-hmm. I've been listening to a lot of, in the book, I talk about the begging and pleading songs. Yeah. And I find myself returning to those in a weird way. I'm listening to a lot of, not the Boys to Men. So I, last night I had a whole thing with Wesley Morris about how I don't like Boys to Men. And him being a Philly person was like, <laughs> up in arms, I'm sorry, I don't like Boys to Men. Uh, the songs, I don't, I like so much of Philadelphia's musical output. I think Boys to Men is a low, a low part of that. But I've been listening to a lot of begging songs. You're loud. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> it was an absolute delight, and all of you will find this too, to read There's Always This Year on Basketball and Ascension. And I think it accomplishes several things, right? Yeah. Um, the two most salient for me as a reader, but also as a writer, were found in your thematic dexterity. You're nimble very nimble as a writer. And you have these sprawling and beautiful, sprawling and controlled still. That's really hard to do where your imagination can wander or wander and you can still pull it back in through a thread. So you have these sprawling and beautiful ruminations. And that's kind of a hallmark of your style, which is what I call your voice. Yeah. So when you were a younger writer, was your voice, which I would call vigorously curious, was it something that you had to accept in time or was it something you've always embraced? It's something I had to accept. And you know, I started writing poems so late compared to everybody else. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will, I mean, I mentioned this backstage. The first time I saw Era was ever was in Columbus mm-hmm. and she was, there was this show called First Draft in Columbus where- oh, I remember that. Writers, yeah, you yeah. did that feature and like writers would come and it was called First Draft because they would read new work that no one had really ever heard. And not just any writers, like this level of writer, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, so I would, I went to, I would go to those like every month, they would have them once a month. I remember seeing your reading and being like, if poems can do that, then I, I want to write poems. You know, I had these moments. And so I, um, reading poems is where I gained that dexterity, I think. The first book of poems I ever got was Gabby Cavalcaresi's um, oh, The Last Time I Saw Me yeah, Earhart. Yeah. And, I didn't even know, and that's an entire book where they're writing in the voices of other people. Mm-hmm. It's all, all, all persona work. Uh, half the book is a poem cycle about people watching Amelia Earhart get in the plane for the last time, and the other half is a poem cycle of people who survived the was it 1944 Hartford Circus Fire. And I, so I was like, oh, now I'm learning that poems can be in other people's voices. And then oh, I got yeah. Adrian Matika's mixology, and I was like, you know, my whole thing was like, I want to write poems about music. And I read the poem Maggot Brain. And I was like, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? I was like, this mm-hmm. poems can be this? And all I've been trying to do for most of my writing career is just stumble after these people I love, the work of people I love. And I think that requires a level of dexterity because I don't have any, you know, I don't have any kind of like, quote unquote, formal training in writing. I was bad in school, never studied English. So I taught myself by just kind of climbing on the shoulders of other people little by little and seeing over their shoulders and what they're working on, you know, mm-hmm. and then trying to not, not, plagiarize obviously but trying to mold myself into someone who is being somewhat flexible in voice and of course I think through that is how we build our own voices Mm -hmm. but early on I was just like I would like to try today to write an Adrian Matika poem or today Mm -hmm. I would like to try to write a Terrence Hayes poem or today I'd try to I would like to try to write a Yona Harvey or a Vivi Francis poem that kind of thing yeah but I think that your background plays into this piece in your writing that makes you so beloved because it's unaffected Yeah. Right. You're able to say exactly what you want to say and say it beautifully without necessarily having the affectations of, um, you know, the history of the canon at at your back. You know what I'm saying? You're thinking about what it is that you want to say. And that has carved a way for you. Like your voice is very distinctive. And what you do is its own craft workshop, right? Because not everybody can do that. Take disparate threads and weave them together in the form of a narrative arc, which pulls me back into the very beginning of the book, right? Where you have this movement where you're talking about, you open the book in pregame talking about enemies and receding hairlines. Yeah. Right. Which is an enemy of its own. (laughs) Which is an enemy of its own, right? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and so my thought was, how the hell did you do that? Right. <laughs> so you start with something that is so far 
from what the thesis or what one thinks the thesis is. Because if you come into the book thinking that it's going to be about strictly basketball and ascension, you have picked the wrong book. This yeah. is a book that is about very many things that Hanif weaves together inside of a, an overarching argument. And so I guess the question is, how, how did you do that? <laughs> I mean, honestly, as a writer, I just yeah. want to know, how do, you, how do you pick the thread up? How do you get the needle through one topic and then spin it into another topic and then get it into another topic and then pull the thread so that you have a tapestry? How do you do that work? Yeah, I like to think of it as you have to know what the center planet is and then weave away for the other planets to orbit around that first so for example very materially in the pregame i needed to get my get to my father quickly mm -hmm. you know i needed to get to my father very early and mm -hmm. i needed to not begin with my father's bald head i needed to begin with saying mm -hmm. i love this person and i mm -hmm. love them through what close watching mm -hmm. right the bearing close witness to my father at a young age is what love was mm -hmm. even if we didn't have a dialogue for it he and i mm -hmm. um my desire to be like him through this rigorous witnessing is what love was. And through that rigorous witnessing, I noticed this thing about his bald head when he ate food. Uh, no spoilers, you'll see it in the first. But <laughs> in order to get there, in order to get there, like to open the book with that, I think would not be uh, pleasing for me or anyone as a reader. I also knew that uh, I wanted to operate in this kind of second person mode through the whole book, which is hard to thread that needle to, mm -hmm. to say I'm going to open the book saying our and we and you and that is not a trick of that moment that is actually going to be the entire book mm -hmm. the entire book is going to deal in these moments of direct address in the second person and so that idea had to come to the forefront in this idea of enemies and then operating very quickly and saying we're talking about enemies but we're actually talking about how closely we love people and therefore we know that anyone who disrupts the affections that we hold for others is an enemy so I've brought up enemies and I've brought up what we're doing in opposition to enemies. And I'm mostly saying, I'm mostly trying to build a short bridge to this idea of close witnessing is a high form of affection and anyone who interrupts the ability to closely witness is an enemy. And since we're talking about close witnessing, I also loved my dad when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. since we're talking about my dad when I was a kid, here's this thing about my dad's bald head and when he ate food. And that's it. And then I was off and running, right? Because mm -hmm. my dad's bald head is actually the center point of this. And I can do anything with that. Mm -hmm. I did that little James Brown trick in the, you know, that James Brown thing is very short, but I needed mm -hmm. to talk about hair and arrogance and what hair can say about, you know, how you talk your shit. Because <laughs> then I could talk about the Fab Five, right? But the whole thing was my dad's bald head. Because from that, I can say, okay, well, there's an easy path here from James Brown to the Fab Five to Michael Jordan to my high school girlfriend who wanted me to shave her head because she loved Michelle and Deggio Cello, um, which like, yeah, I still have that. I have the, uh, like a, a smaller poster of Bitter, that album cover in my house. And mm -hmm. I think of her every time I see it. I texted her like earlier this week and was like, you're, I mean, she knows she's in the book. Anytime I write about someone who I'm still on good terms with, I let them know. And so she's read that portion of the book. And I was like, do you want me to send you this, like, Michelle Indigo cello? And she's like, absolutely not. <laughs> so, but, you know, once, once you get there, because what that's doing, too, is saying this person I loved who lost their mother to cancer and who could not bear it and who wanted to shave their head because it would bring them closer to their mother, uh, that is not that far off from me wanting mm. to shave my head as a kid and be like my father. And that's all, you know what I mean? And, of course, knowing that I would have to end on LeBron in some way, that path is already set. The path is already easy. And I think it took, I could have done the easy thing and said, and LeBron has a receding hairline, right? <laughs> but, like, that's, like, the easy, you know, that's a lazy approach when we're actually talking about, like, close witnessing and affection. Right, right. right? And, and instead, I got to do this kind of last-minute volta where it's like you're reading a book about mortality, you're reading a book. The reason this countdown clock here exists in the pregame is because this is all about beginning with something and slowly watching it diminish, be it time, be mm. it hair, be it your proximity to a place you love. Um, that is the final trick, right? Mm -hmm. The final trick is always I've set the centerpiece, which is my father, uh, and through my father you're exploring all these things about hair. And, yes, of course, we're going to talk about LeBron's hair, but not for as long as you think we are mm -hmm. because what I'm actually talking about is watching something slowly diminish and understanding that every, every single one of us is entitled to diminishing. We're entitled to that. Absolutely. Uh, if there is one entitlement in our life, it is that it will end. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how we get all, I don't know if that made sense. That makes perfect sense, absolutely. Yeah.
Um, also thinking that in the book, one of the major vessels for your personal and cultural memory is a place. Yeah, for it's sure. It's Columbus and it's Ohio more broadly, right? And so how, how do you think about place in holding memory? How important are geography and memory intertwined when you're trying to recount? You know, it's so, it's so, uh, I, I think about gentrification a lot in the horrors of gentrification as a, um, as a machine of generational memory collapse, mm -hmm. right? Um, my first book of poems, Crying Ain't Worth Much, was largely about the gentrification of Columbus, Ohio. And I remember the first time a reporter ever interviewed me for something was like a semi-local reporter who came to Columbus and I drove them around parts of my neighborhood that didn't look like my own neighborhood anymore. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, this doesn't look like that as bad of an area as you wrote in the book, um, which I don't think I really wrote as a bad area, but you know. Uh, <laughs> yes, this reporter was. You know what I mean? It's like... Uh, but the more important thing was like, I, I thought through that I mean, I gave a, a really harsh response to that, but I also thought through that in a very material way where it's like, actually what gentrification does do is disallows you to show people who you were, not oh. just where you came from, but who you were. Who you were, yeah. And that means that no one you love can touch, who did not love you then, can touch who you actually were. And some of the actual things in this book, I go through that whole process of like, I can't envision the people I loved as children, right? Which is another way of me saying, so many of us have had our childhoods just uprooted sure. in a very geographical architectural way, in a very literal architectural way. Mm -hmm. However, the work of acting against that, I believe, is the oral tradition. Like I grew up in the oral tradition, which is to say that my father has like seven total stories, but they feel like, <laughs> they feel like 700, right? You know, they feel like so, anytime I, my dad will tell, and my dad and I, you know, we have a, as kind of touched on the book, you have like a notoriously complicated relationship. But, you know, I just saw him. Um, you know, we don't see each other a lot. And we talk sporadically. We talk largely only about music. Um, but I saw him. My niece, like, played. Uh, my niece won a state championship in basketball. I'm so just, like, aggressively <laughs> proud of her. Like, beyond right belief on. proud of her. And we, I saw him. We were, like, walking out of the state championship game. And my dad went to this one of these he's go-to stories of, um, you know, a time when, a time when my oldest brother dislocated his finger on the basketball court. You know, the thing that he's told, and he's like, you know, is, we're leaving this basketball game. I, I was thinking about Schwab, and that time he dislocated his finger. And I was like, I've heard this story 900 times. <laughs> but, but I was like, I'm ready to hear it again. Like, I'm ready to right hear on. it again because what you, one, it's never told the same way. It's never told with the same tone and temperature and pace. But also what you are doing is actually restructuring a physical geography or the memory of a geography that doesn't exist anymore. You're mm -hmm. talking about a, you're, you're restructuring a neighborhood that is currently under the siege of gentrification. And in doing that, you're making it a lot easier for me to actually see the material realities of that neighborhood. Yeah. And I believe that my work is really beholden to that process of not even, I mean, archival, yes, but really aggressively wrestling back the material realities of a place that becomes more elastic every time something new yeah. is built over something old. Yeah, right on. And there is a certain intimacy that's involved Absolutely. with that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like you have to, we both came up in SLAM. And yeah. so, yeah. Um, and we recognize what it is to be in front of an audience. And so when you're slamming, you want to make sure that you're pulling your audience in to some degree, creating a space that feels safe to share a story. It feels yeah. like it's one-on-one. -on -one. Almost in the same way, like I think about Puck in A Midsummer Summer yes. Night's Dream, right? Yes. Where you have the direct address, and you talked about this yep. earlier. But it seemed to me that the direct address was a way to pull the audience in. Absolutely. So it just feels like you're having this sense of intimacy. It's almost like you're storytelling your, like your dad would be. So you're telling yep. the story for the 900 and first time. Yep. And, but this time it's a different audience, and you can pick out different things. Yeah. So how important was your training from there, learning how to read an audience in pulling in those elements, the elements of the direct address inside of the piece? Yeah, of slam the it, I would say slam it being an avid music listener. You know, one of oh, the earliest right lessoners, uh, lessoners, one of the earliest lessons I learned in slam was I, 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 uh, I read a poem at an open mic, and for some reason the poet Jamal May was in town. Ah, uh, yeah. 
this was, you know, there was such a symbiotic relationship between Detroit and Columbus Poet. Truly. Like, I, came, I came along in the slam at an interesting time, but a great time to be in Columbus, because there was this, this relationship with, like, the, the really, I think, A, not the, but A, golden era of Detroit poetics. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, every, it was like every weekend, there was like a, Detroit, a great Detroit poet in Columbus. <laughs> and so I read at this open mic, and Jamal May was there. And after I read, he said this thing to me, very kindly in the way that he, you know, back then could at least, he was like, you know, if you're gonna read your poems out loud, you might as well be good at it. <laughs> and I and I and then I watched what? him read. And then I and, and not only did I watch him read, I watched him read at the time it was he read The Sky Now Black with Birds, which is a beautiful poem mm -hmm. that was like brand fucking new. It was like new new. And he read it and I was like, I've never seen anything like I mean like truly. Um and I was like, How did you learn that? Mm -hmm. And then he and he was so generous to me. He like sent, either sent me or showed me a video of the late great Blair reading the little Richard poem. Right on. And yeah. he was like, you have to kind of go to a different place. Like this is, he was like, I go to a different place and he showed me that Blair poem and he's like, that is a person going to an actual different place, right? In, at, in, inside that place, you can do whatever you want, right? Like you can, yes, this is a poem of someone embodying little Richard, but like it actually doesn't matter. It, little Richard is a vessel through which an audience is being reached, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, okay, so I not only have, I have to learn to be not an effective reader, but a version of myself who is willing to go to a different place in my work that is perhaps a lonelier place than my actual living place. Because in order to su submit myself to this commitment to the second address or even a breaking of the fourth wall, yeah. I have to say, I am desperate to bring you along with me. I have something that I not only want to show you, but I'm required to show you. And I need you to understand, you know, the miracle of, I use Tracy Chapman's Fast Car in writing workshops, like for real. I dissect Fast Car in writing workshops because the magic of Fast Car is, it is the, the writing device. The first two verses of Fast Car is like, you've got a fast car, but you are aware that the you is a, a direct address to a beloved, right? You've got a fast car, I, the you and I are dueling. But what happens in the third verse is the miracle, But because what, what happens? Tracy Chapman breaks the fourth wall. She turns to the listener and says, okay, listen, here's the deal. My dad was like this, he drank, I had to take care of him. So now we, and then she turns away. She turns away like you weren't even ever there. But in her turning away, you understand her set of circumstances differently. You understand that the, although I was recently corrected on this because I believe it's true, I, I, I lived like the first like 10 years of my life being like, well, the, the person in the fast car is talking to like a no good man. You know, I'm thinking about the no good man. Songs, mm -hmm. but, you know, Tracy Chapman is notoriously, uh, you know, there's like genderless in her approach to her mm -hmm. love songs, her you know, whatever. So she turns away from us and turns back to the person. But you understand that there's a clear arc between her father letting her down and this person letting her down in a similar way, but she's still beholden to that same level of care. And that only works by her turning away and saying, I need you to understand something before I go on, because you understanding this will allow you to walk with me to a place through which you will understand me better and maybe understand yourself better. And even if we don't figure anything out along the way, we've perhaps made a wider depth of feeling for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so my work is always trying to find this way to say, I have something that I want to show you and I can't figure it out on my own and we might not figure it out together, but I would like to try, you know, the, it's, I've, I know this is a long answer, but I will say like another thing that draws me to songs, so much of my training and writing has been through song. I love a songwriter who doesn't, the reason I love Springsteen, for example, is because so many of his songs don't have a neat resolution. Right. He's content with not figuring shit out. Like Atlantic City is one of my favorite songs in the world because at the end of Atlantic City, it's like, I, shit's still kind of fucked up. And yeah. you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and, he, and he's kind of just like, you know, I might have to, I might have to literally join the mob. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> Guess I'll check y'all out on the other side, you know what I mean? And I, I think that's I think it's wonderful to be like, yeah, you know, Atlantic City begins and you're like, this is a fucked up song. Like this everything is going wrong in this town for this man. And then you get to the end of the song, it's like stuff is maybe worse than it was before. And Springsteen is so committed to that approach of like, this is just what it is. Stuff is bad and then you gotta turn away and I leave you here with an understanding that stuff can be bad. And I, I love that. Yeah. And I was thinking just in terms of like the narrative arc, the idea of closure feels very Western, right? Because if you look at films from other yes. parts of the world, they don't have the tidy box that closes, right? right? There's still this opening. So it seems like in your work, there is a sort of rejection of closure, which is a rejection of kind of the Western paradigm or the Western trope of what should happen in the arc. Yes. How do you 
does that draw you into your next work? Like refusing to close one, does it draw you to the next thing that needs to be done? What does that do for you? I think I get a lot of my, it draws me to poems. It, it really pushes me into poems. Mm. Because poems I can, because I, I wrestle with lack, lack of closure. I really do. Mm. The way I ended this book was, was hard. The way I ended Little Devil in America was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, but then I push myself into poems because I feel like there's a flexibility. There's like an artistic bent towards. But in my real actual life, I struggle with that. You know, I, yeah. I want, I just finished, um, I don't want to spoil this. I won't, I'll speak in vague terms. I just finished the um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith reboot. And the way that ended, I was like, I was texting my homies like, this is fucked up. Like, I would like, <laughs> I would like some clarity. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, my, and my homie's like, that's actually not what you want. Like, you think that you want that because you have been, which I will say too, not to be a television critic, I thought the Mr. and Mrs. Smith reboot was very good. And I actually, I have a, I have a real gripe with like, I, we won't go, I won't go far down this road, like 30 seconds down this road. You can go into it, go into it. I have a real gripe with people who were like, I don't think Donald Glover and Maya Eskimo, because they, they're not sexy enough. One, people were talking about those two like they are like ogres. <laughs> <laughs> like these are like very conventionally attractive people. <laughs> I was looking in the mirror at myself like, is it, like if, if they think those people are bad, like what am I doing? But also the thing that people understand, chemistry is sexy, like chemistry is those Absolutely. two had like electric chemistry chemistry that's sexy like i don't i think we've gotten away from this is a longer thing that i won't get into but people are just like <laughs> you mash two pretty people together and something happens when it's actually chemistry has to work but what i'm saying is in television and in film i think my brain is like in a way poisoned by that western approach yeah to wanting closure and i find myself complaining when a film doesn't end the way i want to but in my work i think i can reject that freely but usually to work out those anxieties I just pour myself relentlessly into poems. Like the minute I finish this book, I turn directly into to drafting poems because I think that I can begin anew and not really be beholden to even figuring myself out. I wrote like 35 of those poems of the same title about flowers and I don't know shit about flowers still to this day mm -hmm. because the work of those poems wasn't I need to find out or get to the bottom of this physical thing. It was how can I extract the most vivid metaphor about mortality and time through this one object, lens through multiple translations. Yeah, how can you be curious? Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, how can you be curious? And there's no end to curiosity. None. You may get what seems like an answer, but it may not be, you know? And there, it's better if it's not, maybe, it's, yeah. It's ex actually yeah. is, you know? And it's almost like how you deal with time uh, in the book. I wanna talk about time as a universe that you're talk talking through as yeah. well. Um, there's no closure there either, actually. Um, no, which I can appreciate. Yeah. There's literally no closure there. Yeah. And so I want to talk, when you get the book, you'll be able to read, but there are these, um, what I call stopwatches or quarter clocks. There's four quarters in the collection and there are these quarter clocks that count down throughout each quarter. And in the first quarter, I started to geek out because this is who I am as a person. I was like, oh my God, there's 38 references to the quarter clock <laughs> with a timeout in praise of legendary aviators yes. after the 15th. Yep. And then the second quarter, there's 43 with one timeout yep. and one intermission. And so, and then I also noticed the section breaks with enjambments between the time signatures yes. where you disjoint syntax to create urgency, yep. to, um, to house meaning, to maybe resist meaning in some ways too. But also, it's a, it's a time-telling measure. The, the line is always a way to line tell time. always a time-telling measure. And so, You're so smart, I'm sorry. <laughs> And also, like, thank you for clocking these things. But yes, you're so It's so, so much fun. It's my pleasure, dude. Like, this is what you do. And it's, like, my pleasure to be able to close read and to talk with you about it. Um, but when you were creating those structural blueprints, because I do think about structure and I think about time a lot in collections, how did you want those time elements to be in conversation with each other? Because you have timeouts, yeah. your intermission, you have the stopwatch that's happening, and then you have the play with the enjambments. How did you want them to converse with each other? And then finally, how did you want the audience to understand that? Yeah, that's so, uh, you're the first person who's maybe, other than my editors, who noticed the, the enjambment and the syntactical devices. Mm -hmm. with the, because that was hard to see. You know, I was like, when I first turned in and drafted the book, they were like, well, why, why is this, you know, like, why is this sentence, and I had smart, great editors, and I'm like, oh, well, this sentence doesn't end here. It is ending on the, I was like, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trust me. Sometimes I feel like you could trick editors who, like, maybe don't read poems a lot, yeah, and yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. I'm just doing a poetry thing. <laughs> it's a poem, leave it yeah, alone. Yeah, will be fine, will be. And they're like, yeah, totally, totally, I got you. It's cool, 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 cool. Right. But, you know, like, I wanted to, one, just straight up structurally, I wanted to create a book that looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. Like, nothing mm -hmm. I'd ever seen. 
And that was really challenging for me until I realized that because I was in pursuit of something I'd never seen before, failure was almost impossible. Right uh, on, it's yeah. Like, you know, it's like there was no way. I would maybe understand failure in this material sense if the language wasn't working on, a, on like a line level. But there was no real large structural failure that could be done because I was running towards a structure that does not exist. Right. And that was just cleansing. I mean, just like, um, and I didn't realize that until I was halfway through the first quarter maybe. And I was like, oh, I, like, sure, I could fuck this up. But even in fucking it up, something I could rebuild something. It's intentional. It's it feels intentional. intentional. Yeah. yeah. And so that was one thing. That was why that was free. But another thing I wanted to do was create this sense of urgency, this sense of pace that is acting in my mind in opposition to some of the stuff that's happening on a line level that mm. is asking people to slow down. Mm -hmm. There's especially, I mean, one special, one special clear trick in the book is where I'm talking about the Dick Snyder shot in 1976, where I keep kind of repeating you know, where I'm kind of like, okay, the shot looked like this. No, no, wait, we're going to go back. The shot actually looked like this. No, let's try this again. The shot looked like this. And through that repetition, I'm trying to get people to, one, slow down. And I'm trying to get people to actually visualize a basketball against a blue sideline paint looking like a sunset. Because that is the only way that I could use the extended metaphor of a game seven being like a sun setting. You mm, know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. there was a lot of ways those timestamps said, go back and read. Go back and read. This still this is still urgent, but go back and read because what I'm actually trying to do is um, slow you down and accelerate you, much like an actual basketball game does sometimes. Yeah. There are basketball games where the last five minutes take an hour, and there are basketball games where the first two quarters take feel what feels like 30 seconds. Exactly. And there's a way that I'm trying to play with the machinery of all of our hearts, mine included, um, where pace and speed are almost. Um, emotional responses you know mm -hmm. like I, i'm actually trying to play with not n in a nefarious way play with your emotions but playing with the playing with one's heart rate or the rate at which um you know there are parts of the book where i speed and no punctuation at all mm -hmm. or i utilize like backslashes are all these things that i you know i'm trying to put but also mm -hmm. this is i will say this too formally because it feels important to say this is uh, I, people, I don't know if anyone here, I, mean, I almost said I don't know if anyone here knows my work. Some of you maybe do. Um, <laughs> but like, if anyone knows my work in any depth or scene, I, Toni Morrison is like, I, I mean, I love Toni Morrison so much. Um, they're like to a, a depth that is like, un, there's no language for how much I love Toni Morrison. And every single thing I write is a simply a failure to reach Toni Morrison. And that, that to, to reach Toni Morrison and fail is to still it's, it's succeed on many fronts and i think this is my most morrisonian book because i was reading song of solomon a lot so like mm -hmm. the flying africans all that shit mm -hmm. and i was reading jazz a lot and there are real portions of this book where i'm attempting to i mean the, the opening of the fourth quarter where i'm walking through the city of cleveland that is literally just the scene in jazz where it's like i love this city daylight slants through the the piece i don't know if anyone's um not to cite myself uh, <laughs> but i don't know if anyone's heard mckinley dixon's record but uh McKinley Dixon, he's a brilliant artist who came out with this album last year called um, Beloved Paradise Jazz. He hit me up and was like, will you read, on, will you be on the intro to my record? And I was like, no, man, I don't, that's not what I do. And he was like, all I would need from you is to read your favorite Toni Morrison passage. And I was like, I'm in. A hundred percent. hundred percent. And so I read, that is what I read. I read that passage from jazz, Daylight Slants, like a, you know, and goodbye to the bad stuff, the sad stuff. The war is over and there'll never be another one. I, that is my favorite passage of language. And literally, I mean truly, that opening quarter four of me walking through downtown Cleveland is that. I mean, it's me trying to do like that through a funhouse mirror. I think yeah. I even utilize the like, there's no more sad stuff line. And it's because I felt by the time I got to the fourth quarter and could do that, I was like, I've maybe earned the right, I've maybe earned the ability to at least see Toni Morrison on the horizon of what I'm writing when before I'm kind of like abstractly staring up at the sky and saying that cloud looks like Morrisonian and I'm going to, I'm going to pull it down. I'm going to pull this down. This time I was like, by the time I got to the fourth quarter, I was like, Miss Morrison is in the room with me, like really in the room with me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I not only that I think about that in abstract ways. Like for example, if I'm writing a poem and I have a Yona Harvey poem up, then Yona is in the room with me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I maybe reference Yona twice tonight because I'm reading I'm rereading her last book and I just adore her. But I was like, Miss Morrison's in the room with me, which means that I have responsibility to the lineage of writers I'm creating in that she is a part of in my mind. And I felt I felt empowered to be like, I can use some of the like the lyrical dexterity that she the way she looks at a city and renders it, I get to do that too. 
Um, but that's a longer way of saying what I was attempting to do with the time was play with pace and play with rhythm and play with, play with expectation, but also make people very aware that whether you know it or not, you're reading a book about the dwindling of time. Absolutely. Whether you know it or not, you're reading a book about how none of us have um, endless time. And I have to say, because he is important to this, this book would not, one of my earliest mentors, um, I had early, a lot of good early mentors, the poet Scott Woods, the poet Will Evans, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And the great Greg Tate. Mm-hmm. And Tate saw like, Tate would get like, I would send him like early ideas of this book. And then when we lost him, you know, the, what, I, what I loved about Greg Tate was he wrote everything like it could be his last thing. Like everything, a review, a, a, a note to a friend, everything he wrote, he wrote it like that could be his last shit, you know? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to write this book for so long and I had talked myself out of it for so long. And you get to a point, at least for me, where I was like, the people I love are diminishing and this has to be the book I write as if I'll never write another book again. And so that means I have to take the biggest swing I could possibly take. And so some of the function of the book too was saying, I am writing an ode to the people I lost because I know I've seen them whole and I've watched them diminish. And I know that I too will diminish. And this time clock is a reminder of the fact that everyone who encounters this book, whether they know it or not, is reading about something that begins abundant and then shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. Can I just say though, for you, I think Morrison is looking from wherever she is, whatever perch she's sitting on, because I'm sure she's sitting on a perch. Yeah, of course. And she's seeing in you an evolution of yeah. the blueprint that she laid. I hope you so. Know? Um, it's, it, you're doing very similar things in terms of how you privilege the gaze, yeah. right? And so you have a woman, she was from Lorraine, Ohio, right? Of course. Lorraine, yeah. Ohio, who privileged her gaze in her community, and that's the exact same thing you're doing here. Yeah. It's privileging the gaze from where you're from, you know, wherever you are. And that is admirable, and Thank that you. is in the lineage of Morrison, and that means that you are a part of her kin and her family in yeah. your writing. That means a lot. Thank you. It's true. Um, the other thing, I have one more question I can ask before I have to go out into the audience, um, and that is we're both from Rust Belt cities, yes. right? Columbus, Detroit, and there are the, there's this narrative that's spun that says that you have to flee those cities once you make it, whatever it is yep. to make it, once you make it or you have some form of success, you have to move on to greener pastures, you have to move out. How do you, what do you make of that narrative and how does the book respond to that skewed narrative where there's this idea of moving out and moving up past what made you, right? Yeah, yeah. The city that influenced city that you. Influ- and, yeah, yeah. Built. I think that one thing I'm trying to do in the book is redefine what making it means. Mm-hmm. Because for example, um, so I live, I bought a house in 2020 on the east side of Columbus, not far from where I grew up. And that was a very intentional move. Like in one of the last black neighborhoods in Columbus, uh, Bronzeville, you know, of course, it's called Bronzeville. Um, <laughs> nice. You know, yeah. Um, but I, I and, um, you know, on Sundays when I'm doing, like, my warm-up walk, before I go on my, I take, like, my long runs on Sundays, I see the pastor at the church down the street from me. He always, like, he always jokingly invites me to church, even though he knows I'm not going to come. But it's just, like, our, di- it's our banter, right? And... He, and the church is small. It's like a, it's like a, you know, almost like a house church. You know, it's got a congregation of, I say, maybe 30, 40 folks, 30, 40 black folks, old black folks mostly. And I saw him, you know, the first kind of warm day in Columbus was in February because the climate apocalypse is dooming all of us. And mm-hmm. um, at an accelerating rate. And um, he was like, yo, I want to show you, you know, he's like, come on, come on I want to show you something. And he normally had this, like, old, he used to drive this old, like, 85, maybe 86 Cadillac, you know? Not even, like, a fancy old, it was just, like, old, beat-up Cadillac. And he was like, I, uh, you know, I, I, put a, I put a new stereo in my car. I want to show you. Because, you know, I, was, I used to talk to him about, like, how I, you, you rattle a block with the trunk. And he was like, I got a new stereo. He showed me his little speakers in his old Cadillac, his old, like, rusted-out Cadillac. And he showed me, he was so proud of it. And I was like, you made it. You know what I mean? Like, you made it in this right. place that you love. That's what making it is for you, and therefore you've made it. And my barber, my old barber, who now, you know, who got gentrified out of his old barber shop mm. and decided to like, just start cutting hair out of his basement, he made it, you know? He found a way to make it. And so making it 
doesn't for me mean making it out. Making it means realigning the interior of the place you love to suit your needs. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get rid of your old 86 Cadillac because you have some, a great deal of emotional affection to it. Then rewire the inside of that to fit your needs. Your barbershop, you know, mm -hmm. I will say this. Right before I started working on this book, a dear friend of mine got out. He was locked up. He was doing a bid, and he, he got out. And his mom, I went to go see his mom before I picked him up. And his mom pulled me aside and said, I really don't want him. He lives, he's from the east side like me, came on the same hood. And his mom was like, I really don't want him back. You know, she was like, I want him back. I want him home, but I don't want him back in the neighborhood because he'll, he's going to get into trouble here. Mm -hmm. You know, like he'll get into trouble again, and it'll be bad, and this and this and that. And I said, okay, well, you know, we got a long drive back from the precinct. Like, well, you know, I'll, I'll talk to him. And I picked him up, and I, you know, I was like, listen, um, what do you need? Like, I can get you set up in the suburbs, you know, or I can get you set up and like, you can come stay with me for a little while and like, whatever you need. But you know, here's what your mom thinks and all that. And he was so offended by this because he said this thing to me that I'll never forget. And it was like, I'm not leaving here. Mm. Like, we built this and he put, he, you know, he's, we built this together as kids. We imagined this utopia of a place and we made it ours and it's still that place. And right. they can't take that from me. And he said this thing to me that I'll never forget, which was like, if I get in trouble, I get in trouble. That's whatever. But if they come and get me, they have to come get me from here. And I believe that that is also making it. Deciding, all of us to some degree have to decide where we want to be taken from if someone is to come and take us. We have to decide what we want. The reason I summoned John Glenn in the book, the, the story of John Glenn going back into space it's when he was like story. in his early or his like, late 70s, is because I, the reason I love John Glenn and I love that story is because he decided what he was willing to die for. Mm -hmm. the, he, he would not, like, papers didn't word it like that. It was worded romantically, like, oh, this John Glenn is, but he spent so many years obsessively trying to convince NASA to let him go back into space as a 77-year-old, even though everything said it would kill him because mm -hmm. he wanted to see space one more time because he's seen the impossible and it is brutal to have seen the impossible and be told that you could never see it again. Right. So John Glenn decided, I want to die for this. And he chose to, he didn't die there, thankfully, but he chose, he chose the thing he was willing to die for. That too is making it, right? Mm -hmm. These are the decisions that I think constitute making it in the world more than any material excess or material wealth. Unless that wealth is serving the community you love deeply, then I don't really care about it. Like this is perhaps why I'm, I'm not hostile towards decoration but I don't care much about decoration mm -hmm. because when I'm, you know, no one's going to read my fucking artist bio at my funeral, I don't. you know? And there is something that comes with the understanding. Another part of this book that's real is there's something that comes with the firm understanding that you're not going to live forever. That allows you to shed this commitment to the material decoration and wealth. The reason this, I guess the last thing is another long answer. I'm sorry. This is, don't be sorry. Um, <laughs> But the, I think about this often. You know, like, there are a lot of functional, sonic, emotional reasons why Johnny Cash's version of Hurt works very well. But you know, the real reason why that version works well is because it was made by a man who, like, knew he was going to die. Not in an abstract way. Mm. Not in a way like we were all going to die. Like, that man knew, actually, factually, that he did not have much time left. Every day off the calendar had a weight to it. And so when he says, you can have it all, my empire of dirt, that means something entirely different, right? That is the kind of approach that I think is required in our living, to say nothing that we do in our lives is actually making it if we are not doing it in service of the places we love and the people we love. And I'm not saying those places have to be the places you're from, but it's got to be someplace. Yeah. Because as we have seen, I think there's no machinery of institution or power will come to save us. And so we have to, in, in fact, save ourselves. And uh, that, to me, is what making it is. That's a gorgeous answer. We have some traveling microphones out in the crowd, and we can take a few questions. Um, to Hanif's point, life is short and time <laughs> is short, so take that into consideration. They can be fluid, though. You can ask like anything you like. It doesn't have to. It can be about the book, of course. I'd be thrilled to talk about the book, but it doesn't have to strictly. Many of you haven't even read the book, right? Uh, I uh, I love you, man. First of all, and thank this, you. this is awesome. Uh, I'm a sneaker lover. I love your collection. Thank Do you, you have a favorite pair of sneakers? Do I have what? 
favorite. Do you have a favorite pair? Oh of yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Thank you for. I don't get to talk about sneakers a lot, even though I feel like it's. You know, the funny thing about my sneaker thing is that there are people. There's like ten intense sneaker people who follow me on Instagram, I think just for my, like, buy every other month sneaker. And it's like, you're enduring a lot just to get to, you know. It's like it's like the dudes who, like, will endure, or not eat, well, I would think it's mostly dudes. The people who, like, endure just to see, like, a thirst trap every, like, once a month. Uh, but my favorite pair of sneakers of all time is the White Cement Jordan 4. Every year, at the top of the year, I order a clean pair of White Cement Jordan 4s so I fuck up a pair. Literally, I was at a New Year's party this year, and, like, shortly after midnight, I was in the corner or, <laughs> you know, like, that's, I guess that's the kind of person I am now. I was like in the, you know, people were like kissing each other around me and I was nudging, like elbowing them out of the way so I could order a pair of Jordan 4s. Um, but yeah, the white cement Jordan 4 is my favorite sneaker. On this, on this tour, um, this is a really kind of like deep cut pair, but I, I bought the, the pinnacle Jordan 4s, the black ones, with the white sole because I was like, I can't, normally I pack a lot of sneakers when I travel, but I was like, I just need a really versatile sneaker that I can wear with a lot of shit. And an all black sneaker with a white bottom is, is one, but also the Jordan 4 silhouette is, is the best silhouette of a sneaker ever made, I think. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is about drummers. So you saw, you mentioned Shaka Khan at the yes. beginning. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on drummers as performers, because Shaka Khan is a drummer. Great I'm drummer. I'm thinking of other drummers like Morris Day, Sheila E. Yep. You know, so, you know, thoughts on drummers, at Anderson Pack, if you want to get more recent too. Yeah. So like drummers as performers. I love a drummer who performs. I love a drummer who, I, one, I, I love more stay. I love more stay so much. <laughs> I was just watching a video. Um, <laughs> how do I, my friends and I, I have this one friend who we talk about, we have this metric called TMNOS, which is uh, acronym for too many niggas on stage. <laughs> and, <laughs> And we talk about this like Morris Day in the Time, peak TMNOS, like TMNOS, like way too many niggas on stage. And it, but it, it works. It's like so incredible. And I, so I love Morris Day is one of those drummers who like got behind the kid, like once he got from behind the kid, he was like, I'm gonna just make all this mine, you know? And I was watching this video of him doing Fishnet on American Bandstand, which is so funny because there's like five saxophone players and like, you know. <laughs> Miami Sound Machine is another one of those TMNO, some TMNOS bands where it's like, how many horn players do you need? Like, <laughs> like come on, Gloria Estefan. Um, but I love drummers. I love Levon Helms so much. Uh, I love a drummer who sings while drumming, you know? I, I think it just seems so hard. But it, it's also the ones who do it fluidly. Um, I love drummers who improvise. I, I think I'll tell two quick things about drummers and then move on. One. I met Levon Helm once back in the day when he, like right before he died, he was doing those concerts at the barn and I went to one and he used to just wander around, you know, if, in between sets when other people would play. And, and one of my friends who I was there with, we just bumped into him, he was drinking something as, <laughs> as is to be expected. And my friend, not knowing what to say, was like, I heard drumming and singing is so hard. <laughs> and Levon, in this imperfect form, Shrugged, took a sip of his drink, and said, "Wasn't never too hard for me." <laughs> and then he just, and then he just vanished. And the other thing I'll say, I love Stevie Wonder. I love Stevie Wonder so much. And there are many differences between Prince and Stevie Wonder, but one central difference is that if Prince plays every instrument on something, you will know. <laughs> he will make sure you know. If Stevie Wonder plays every single instrument on something, he's making up like aliases and like, you know, nudging, you know, like he produced all these mini Ripperton albums under this like, you know, a different name, an entirely different name. So I got, I don't know how I found this shit. Um, actually, there, I do know how I found this shit and there is, a, there is a Philly connection to how I found this shit that I cannot reveal fully. But um, <laughs> I, got, I got all of the isolated drum tracks from Stevie Wonder's like Golden Run and you can hear, you can tell when Stevie Wonder is the one playing drums because you can hear him humming in the headphones, which I think is not only beautiful, but it defines for me that he is playing the drums not like a drummer then, but like a songwriter, right? He is like building a path that only he knows and following it. That is so fucking cool to me, you know? Because uh, I think we talk about drummers as like the quote unquote backbone of a band, which is true. But when you've made the song already and you are simply filling in that gap, then something different and it's, it's a different kind of alchemy there. And I think Stevie yeah. Wonder's a beautiful, yeah. 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 Mm. One more question for time's sake, unfortunately. Is, hello, can you all hear me? 
I hear you. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, hello. Uh, uh, so I was thinking about fire and how I was raised Muslim. Yes. And Satan, Shaitan, is made of fire. And yeah. um, I'm also like, it's Ramadan, and I'm also thinking about Palestine. Yep. And um, I'm thinking about like fire. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I understand. Um, I'm just thinking about what you were saying earlier about, like, fire. And sorry, I don't remember exactly what you said, but you said something about, like, the power of it and the villainy of it. Mm -hmm. And, like, but also, like, how it's not always just that. Right. And, like, I have really complex feelings about my Islam. I don't know. Yeah. Very much same. Yeah, Very you know, much yeah. Same. But um, I don't know. I was wondering if you were thinking about the devil when you were right, thinking about yeah, all that. Yeah, because the stories we hear, one, that's a good question, and thank you for that. But the stories we hear in Islam about fire and shaitan specifically are, for me, haunting in a way that, and particularly hell, the Islamic rendering of hell is so uniquely horrifying. And the things that, and I know this part is not unique to Islam. I think this is a very, very religious tactic. The things that will get you banished to hell, like the, you know, there's that, there's that thing about the grain of rice that everything you leave on your plate weighs against you on the day of judgment. That to me is such a horrifying indictment in one that just does not seem logical. It leaves no room for grace, which I think is required when the hell that is described in the Quran is the hell that we understand. I think there should be a wide berth for grace. But also, that suggests to me that fire is a tool of power when wielded by those who already have it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and not, it's not to speak in a literal abstract way, like there are, and not, we can speak about this globally, certainly, but even if we just wanna say, not leave our country, crops were burned, right? Mm -hmm. Houses, to burn a cross on a yard is, is a flex of power and fear, to burn crops in an area. But if we are to speak globally, and particularly if we're to speak about Palestine, I would really encourage people to, um, you know, I'm really into the work of Jumana uh, Mana, uh, who does like films uh, about the history of crops in Palestine and how those crops were attacked and that as an act of slow but consistent, just um, diminishing of a generation, right? Diminishing food so that you, uh, the power structure, the occupying power structure in this case, have the ability to enforce how much food people get and how, how they get it, right? So yes, thinking about that, but also thinking about fire as a way of cleansing, because I did grow up watching the LA riots on television. Like I was a kid when the LA riots happened, and I remember being held back from school. My parents had me watch it. And my parents were very, very political, very political. Um, and not, you know, not applying a value judgment to it, just saying like, these are people who are angry and who have decided that nothing is better than what they have, mm. right? And so they will throw a, a glass bottle on fire through a convenience store if a young girl was killed there. Because if that can happen in that building, that building does not deserve to exist. Mm -hmm. And I, as I say in the book, I don't wanna place an individual value judgment on that, but I do place an understanding on that. That to me, is a commitment to your community to say, if Latasha Harlins can be murdered in this convenience store, then maybe this is not a place that is actually useful to this community, mm -hmm. if a young black girl can be murdered in here and have there be no consequences for it, right? It's, I think people think about the LA riots in terms of Rodney King, but there were other elements to that, yeah. right? And you know, in Minneapolis, if people are setting fire to a police precinct wherein folks like cops murdered, you know, June Jordan is, I, I adore June Jordan so much, and June Jordan, uh, I don't know if people's ever ever heard her. I know people read the poem about police violence, but I don't know if people ever heard, have ever heard her read that in her own voice. But that's a required listen. It's a required read, but it's a required listen, because the way June Jordan reads that poem is through a mode of inquiry. Do you think I don't, has anyone ever heard her read that poem? The way she does the sound device, where it's like, "We murdered a cop." And every time they killed a black boy, we, and then she goes, you know, the poem as you would read it would think, do you think the murder rate would drop the expedition, you know, you know, urgently or whatever, but she pauses and turns to the audience as though it's a question to you, actually. June Jordan knows the answer. 
The question is, the burden is on you as people here to say, maybe if we burn down the police precinct, that will say, don't kill people who are unarmed in the streets. Now, we also know that power is power and power will move forward no matter what, but to have a stake in the ground and to utilize fire, for example, as something as a cleansing tool, um, and not in a way that like wipes out a people, but ways that said, certainly not in a way that wipes out a people, um, but in a way that says like this institution does not serve us and it harms us and therefore it shouldn't exist. That is repurposing, I think, the way that fire has been used to diminish the lives of both black folks, indigenous folks, certainly in the Americas and abroad, not just Palestinian folks, but South African folks, Sudanese folks. Like there's, there's a way that fire has been used and weaponized to diminish populations, but also in another way, in a perhaps gentler way, uh, and I don't know about gentler, but in a way that is less material than political, I was also thinking about um, burning as an emotional approach, because I sometimes think, I know I'm giving another long answer and pushing us over time, but forgive me. Um, people talk about desire, like when people say like burning desire, I'm always like, that's so fucking corny. But that is actually what it feels like. I, you know, I don't know actually how to, then I feel like a, a rush of desire, and it's like, oh, that does, uh, it doesn't feel like burning in, in any sense that I understand it, but there is an actual thing happening in my body that feels unsettling that is um, like what, you know, burning my hand on the stove feel, has felt like. So it's not like being on fire, but it's like this kind of shock of, and so I was also playing with this idea of the internal feeling of having something that you need to get out of you, or in other words, extin extinguish, uh, and does that render you more powerful or less powerful? Mm. I don't place a value judgment on that either, I suppose. Does, that, does any of that make sense? Thank you. That seems like a perfect place to end the evening. Thank you all so much. Thanks to Hanif.